scripture reading this morning before our sermon is coming from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. Genesis 2, verses 23 and 24. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Certainly appreciate your presence here this morning. We have a number of visitors with us, and we want you to know that we are honored that you've come our way. And we hope and pray that we'll conduct ourselves in such a way that you'll want to come back again. We're thankful to uh, our campers have returned home from camp as well as our counselors have come home from camp. And they seem to be uh, a sound mind and sound body after 105 um, heat wave, I guess it went through there. The idea of, of camp is certainly a great one and we are proud to have a part in that and certainly we want to encourage uh, all of our young people to take advantage of, uh, of such an opportunity. The home as God would have it has come upon hard times. When we stop and consider just the husband and wife relationship, it has decreased over time. As a matter of fact, when you see different reports, most will say that 50% of all marriages end in divorce. There was one report I read from 2012 said that that number had gone well above 50%, about 62%. To find something more current, you have individuals who uh, probably are not doing an accurate survey, but at the same time, it will hover around 50%. What's happened? The passage that was read for you a moment ago was God establishing the very first divine institution. That he would look upon all of the creation that he had made and saw that there was not anyone suitable for his first creation, Adam. That after he had brought him from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that man became a living soul, that he said that he needed a help meet, a suitable partner, uh, one that could carry on the very demands that God would have upon them to be fruitful and multiply, and so it's restrictive in nature in the sense that it would be male and female. And certainly our society has taken upon a very banner of untruth of allowing those of the same sex to engage in such a relationship from a legal standpoint. But yet the benefits will never be complete. When you stop and give consideration, the home and the family concept, in so many ways it's failed in our society, not just here within the confines of this nation, but rather throughout the entire world. We have to admit those failures. We have to remit, admit those failures not only as a society, but we have to admit those failures as the church of our Lord. We have to admit those failures even within the confines of our own homes. And to do that, we have to admit that the failure of the homes has to do with the failures of those who make up those homes. 
God intended for the home to be much like a heaven on earth. That it is surrounded with love and peace. That there's much compassion and mercy. And that's seen in forgiveness and service. God gave divine instructions. And so many homes are ignoring the instructions or maybe some are even ignorant of the instructions that they're like ships that are being cast out into the sea and they have no compass. Or or perhaps they have no, no charts to show them where they need to go or perhaps they have no rudders to direct them in the directions that they should go. And, well, the end result is as the cliche says, the home or the marriage even is going to be on the rocks. In Ephesians chapter 5, the text that we'll be looking at today describes the home as a place where people involved are to receive something from that relationship. And when everyone fulfills his or her responsibilities or his and her God-given roles, that the home will be exactly what God wants it to be. That little piece of heaven, if you will, on earth. The home is a place where, number one, the husbands are lifted and strengthened. The husbands are are lifted up and they're strengthened. In Ephesians chapter 5 beginning there in verse number 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now I know when we look at that word submission or submit as we read in the New Testament, I know that that falls upon deaf ears in so many ways in our society because they look at it as a way of being controlled. That a woman might look at this as sometimes being under the thumb of a dictator or a ruler. But God's never given it that definition. As a matter of fact, when you look at the idea of God creating the woman, he said... She is the help me. She's the suitable one to stand right next to him. The woman completed what was lacking in the man. And her submission allows him to fulfill his God-given role as the head. Uh, See, notice if you will, if you go down to verse number 23, you begin to see a comparison between him and the church. Watch what he says, beginning in verse 23. He says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now watch this. He's making a a grand comparison. That these individuals in Ephesus, these Christians in Ephesus, would understand what it means to be in subjection to Christ as the church. And to be in subjection to Christ as the church is to be in subjection willingly. That they will see the importance of allowing themselves to submit to the will of the one who saved all of mankind. Allowing themselves to line up with the teachings of the Savior who walked this earth that now sits at the right hand of the Almighty God. The submission of the church, again, is a willing submission. Jesus' care and concern for the church makes this submission possible. And he puts this in the likeness of husbands to their wives. Just think about if the husband would take upon his God-given role 
as a caregiver and full of compassion, how easy and willingly the wife would be in his submission. Again, it's not a controlling factor. It's a leadership factor. His responsibility is to help her to get to heaven. To support her in her God-given roles. His responsibility is to help her to see that they both have a future, an eternal future in heaven. If you go back to the book of Genesis, go back to Genesis chapter 2. Look, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 3. Begin looking with me, if you will, in verse number 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said... Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth, not, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that it was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, question. It goes directly from a conversation between the serpent and the woman whom God gave to the man. That she sees, and first of all, she quotes what the man has already said. She goes back to the actual law that was given to Adam... And she gives it correctly that in the day they eat thereof, they shall surely die. Well, the temptation comes in the form that thou shalt not surely die, but not only that, but your eyes will be open. You'll know things like God knows them. And so when she saw the tree, she desired to eat thereof, and she took of the fruit and ate it and gave to her husband with her. Does it not sound as though that he's standing right there? Does it not imply that this individual was not fulfilling a God-given role to lead her, but rather he took upon himself just to tell her what God said and not protect her from the evils against those things which God said were contrary When you have a a husband in the home who can stand out in the front with his wife's hand in his and the word of God in the other. That's a recipe for success. She needs him to be caring and compassionate. She needs him to have his ears open. But yet he, she needs his direction. She needs his leadership. She needs him to fulfill his God-given role. The home is where husbands are lifted up and strengthened. But also... This little piece of heaven on earth, as God would have it, is where wives are loved and supported. Look at verse 25 of our text in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5 and verse number 25. Here Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing 
of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. Now think about the husband's love for his wife. The idea is that he makes a, a comparison again. His love is a supreme love, even as Christ loved the church. Even as. When you think about everything that Jesus went through, when he came to this earth to establish his church in Matthew 16, he, verse 18, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he told them, so in other words, the Hadean realm was not going to hold him back from busting through and establishing the second divine institution, the church. The church in which the saved are added to according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. And so he took great care of this. There was so much teaching. But all the teaching was done in love. And this is an agape love. This is the same love that we read about in 1 Corinthians 13. You remember if, if a person had all these things, the, uh, the ability to speak in tongues and to work miracles and to prophesy if he does it without love. He's but a tinkling brass or a, a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. He, he's just a noise maker. I wonder sometimes if we have too many noise makers within the confines of our homes. Oh, they say a lot, but sometimes they don't mean what they say. Oh, they do a lot, but they don't do according to the will of God. And so when you see the wife is to be loved the way that Christ loved the church, that he would give himself for it. I don't know too many men. I don't, to be honest with you, I don't know any men that would not see their wife in physical danger and step in front of her to help her avoid that danger. I don't know of, uh, of any man that would not be there right there with his wife and warn her uh, with words of the dangers that might be unknown. But I know a lot of men who treat their wives in a way that make it difficult and hard and for some impossible to submit to them. They stand up in a dictator role. They stand up in some way as they are the boss or controller. They put themselves in the position of a master with a slave. Do any of those comparisons resemble Christ and his church? Well, of course not. So it shouldn't be represented within our own homes. Uh, sometimes we hear men today say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my foot down. Uh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Let me know if the toes didn't get out there a little further than what you anticipated. Uh, you hear men today, you know, they, they, they don't want to take their rightful leadership role. And I understand that they're, they're kidding around. And, and, and it, it, uh, it's one of these things that's personal with me. And, and it, it bothers me to no end. But they'll, they'll say to uh, perhaps their buddies and sometimes even their brothers, they'll say, you know, I, I'm, um, I'm the head of my house. But, but my wife, she, she, she's the neck. 
What does that say about Christ? Well, really, what does that say about him? Because Paul just made a comparison between the husband-wife relationship and that of the church, or that of the hus- husband-wife relationship with the church and Christ. So is the church the neck? Are we turning Christ where we want him to go? I guess if you look in the religious world, it might look like that. But the idea is that it can't be in our homes. We wouldn't dare think about doing that in the church. The wise man Solomon once said, Whosoever findeth a good, uh, findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor with the Lord. It's a treasure that he has given you. Something of great value he's given you. And from that standpoint, she deserves every bit of you. The love that Christ had for the church was a sheltering love. The fact is the wife should be able to wrap herself in the love and feel secure from all, un- from all harm. That's why, again, Solomon would say better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Proverbs 15, verse 17. The home is being attacked from all sides, but also the home is being attacked on the inside. And the fact is, The home should be where the husband is lifted and strengthened and the wife is loved and supported. And thirdly, the home, this little piece of heaven on earth, the children are led and schooled. They are led and schooled. Uh, Turn over to the next chapter there, chapter 6, beginning in verse number 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Children are to be schooled to respect parental demands. A child's first classroom is going to be the home. And his first teachers are going to be the, the, his mother and his father. Thus, a child's respect for or a lack of respect for authority can always be traced back to the home. His respect for or the lack thereof. In Proverbs 29 in verse 15, the Bible says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bring his his mother to shame. We are homes are being dictated by people like Dr. Spock. They're being dictated by people like Oprah. They're being dictated by people who have no concept of God and what He requires. We have too many homes today that refuse, parents who refuse to spank their children, and yet it is a God-given privilege for the parent to do just that. Nobody has instructed the parent to come in an angry rage and beat their child. But wisdom follows within the rod and the reproof of the parent. There's a learning for respect and authority. And it's done out of love. There should be a There should be a place within the mind of every parent 
when you see the command here in verse number 4 of our text, it says, provoke not to wrath. In other words, do not excite bad passions by severity, injustice, or unreasonable exercise of authority. So it brings us to the idea that this is not to be done in a wrong way, but there is a truth in doing it the right way. But there's also regulations for the proper development of the child. The nurture and admonition, this involves a whole process of instruction and discipline. Our children are being raised by computers. There's a book that was put out a few years ago called Glow Kids. And one of the chapters he, uh, the, the author goes through is looking into schools who saw the idea of, of giving screens to their students at grades 6 through 12 helped in their development. But also, what was put in the back of the research was the fact of their addictions to such and the effects that it had on their learning down the road. Well, it was such a good idea that, that these kids were actually being occupied in some way that they start introducing them in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. The research was completely different. But what astounds me is the fact that schools are still practicing this. The addiction rate rose something like 75%. But go into every home today and what do you see? Computer screens, laptops, iPads, TVs. These are things within themselves are not evil things. But they take the place many times of education, they take place many times of parenting. And putting those in the place that God has given you, husband and wife, mother and father, the God-given right to bring this child up in the nurture and admonition. Again, that's why Solomon for a third time said, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Many times. This is about love. This is how much we love that we would bring such discipline within our homes. When you think about how beautiful homes are, and when you think about how beautiful God is, that God cannot make anything that's not beautiful. And when you look at that, and you begin to think that this home that God has, has established, the very first divine institution, it, it's a home where where husbands are going to be lifted up and strengthened. It's going to be a home where the wife is loved and cared for. But it's also going to be a home where the children learn or they are schooled and disciplined. From this standpoint... We have to look at our homes today. It doesn't matter if we're uh, not parents yet, but look to be in the future. It doesn't matter if we're parents now and maybe our children have grown and, and gone away. This concept still has to be within the home because that influence never goes away, good or bad. And with that said, you have to look within the confines of your own home this morning. Is it the home that God established when he took that rib from the side of Adam 
And he brought to him the woman. And he said, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. We were once twain, but now one. Is that our homes today? That's where it all starts. This morning we offer heaven's invitation. It's the invitation that our Lord offered in Matthew chapter 28. When he said in, or in Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 28, when he says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. That invitation has been extended through the gospel of Jesus Christ when Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16 and verse number 16. But that invitation continues to extend even to the child of God, the, uh, the Christian, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. And the fact is that if our life is not what it ought to be, if you're not the father you ought to be, you're not the mother, maybe the husband or the wife, Maybe you're not the child that has come into subjection to your parents. Maybe as a Christian, you have just fallen away from God's grace, Galatians 5 and verse 4. You need to come back in repentance and prayer, Acts 8 verse 22. Confess that or acknowledge that sin or sins in your life and God is faithful and just. He will forgive you, 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. If we can assist you, if we can encourage you, if we can help you understand better, we hope that you'll come right now as together we stand and as we sing.